Abraham is the father of the Jewish nation. He's the first Hebrew, so to speak, that ever was. A nation created by God. And God told Abraham, I will bless those that bless you and I will curse those that curse you. Do you think God really means that? Do you think God will really deal with those that curse Israel? We'll look at it today as we look at God's Word. Welcome, beloved, to Precepts for Life. Thank you so much, so much for wanting to know God's Word, for wanting to understand what God has said, for desiring to discover truth for yourself, for disciplining yourself to know God, to understand His salvation, to grasp His knowledge, to have wisdom on how you are to live. Thank you for studying the Bible because you fear the Lord, because you respect Him, because you trust Him. And I want to assure you that if this is your heart, the Lord will be the stability of your times. In other words, of your life, as you move through life, God will be the stabilizing force. God will be the faithfulness of your life. In other words, you can know Him, and what you know about Him, you can know is absolutely true. Thank you. Thank you for studying. Thank you for coming alongside this program. Thank you for supporting it. Thank you for the privilege of allowing me to share his word. You know, I believe it is so critical in these days that we understand the whole counsel of God, that we devote ourselves to knowing God because the Bible says in Isaiah 5 that his people went into captivity for a lack of knowledge. In other words, they didn't believe God. And we're going to see today as we look at Isaiah chapter 34 that God judges those to whom he gives great opportunities. And when he judges those to whom he gives great opportunities, his judgment is greater. As we look now at Isaiah 34 and 35, which will, by tomorrow, wrap up our study for this week, we have moved from the woes that are in chapter 28 all the way through chapter 33 to now God's word about his judgment of the nations and his establishing of his kingdom. And it's almost like from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 35, he's come full circle. He has a pattern. He talks about Israel's sin. He talks about the judgment of Israel's sin. But he also talks about Israel's future. He tells us that there will be a remnant. And that remnant is called the Holy Seed. Those out of all of Israel that will believe, that will go through the fire of God's consuming fire and yet will hold fast to Him. He also tells us in chapters 1 through 35 what He's going to do to the nations. And this starts in chapter 13 and it goes all the way through chapter 23. In chapter 24 through chapter 27, then he talks about what he's going to do to the earth and how he's going to lay it waste and how out of all that shambles and that judgment, he is going to bring forth Zion. The centerpiece of Isaiah chapter 1 through 35, the centerpiece of it all is Zion. It is Jerusalem. Now as we come to chapter 35 of Isaiah... 34, excuse me, he is talking about his judgment of the nations. We've already looked at that. I don't have time to review it, but I want you to know you can get all of this teaching and you can listen to it 
any time. And you can study if you miss a program. Our passion is to get you into the Word of God so you know truth. Now, in Isaiah chapter 34, he talks about his sword being sated in heaven. He talks about it ju uh, descending for judgment upon Edom. Now, just before this, he's talked about how he's going to judge all the nations. But now he focuses in on Edom. And your question has to be, why does he focus in on Edom? What is the point that he is making? Well, the point is that he's going to deal with Edom. But why is he telling us this about Edom? I think that there are other truths, other precepts for life that we need to see there. Now, one of the things that we suggested that you do is that you mark every reference to Edom. Since Edom is, uh, means red, then what I would do is I would color it red. Now, when you look at a map, and you can get out your map from your study guide, but when you look at a map, you see that to the east of the Jordan River, the Jordan River goes from the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea. To the east of the Jordan, you find Ammon, and then you find Moab just a little bit east and south of the Dead Sea, and then below that, Almost opposite, and this is very important, the Arabah, the desert part the, the, uh, of Israel that leads from uh, uh, down to a lot, which is at the point at the top of the, Dead sea, uh, of the Red Sea, opposite the Arabah is Edom. That's where Edom is. So now watch what he says about Edom. He says, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is sated with fat, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of ram, rams, for the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra. Now Basra is a place in Edom, a great slaughter in the land of Edom. It's, remember Isaiah's poetry. So he says it one way and then he says it again. It says, wild oxen will also fall with them, young bulls with strong uh, ones and their land color it red will be soaked with blood and their color it red for Edom dust will become greasy with fat from just what spills out from this sacrifice for the Lord has a day of vengeance and by the way it, when he talks about fat you saw in the Old Testament when he laid down the law in Leviticus that the sacrifices that the fat of the sacrifice sacrifice always belong to the Lord. It says, for the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. In other words, God is doing this to Edom in vindication of what they did to Zion. It says, its streams, talking about Edom, will be turned to pitch and its loose dirt into brimstone and its land will become burning pitch. Now that's what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah. It will not be quenched by night or day. Its smoke will go up forever and ever. From generation to generation, it, Edom, will be desolate. None will pass through it forever and ever. And you want to mark your time phrase there. You want to put a clock around forever and ever. What he's saying is he's going to clear out all the human beings and it is going to be so desolate that it's going to stay that way forever and ever. Now he is talking about present day Jordan. Look at your geography. And Edom is present day Jordan. It's Ammon, Moab, and Edom. And this is the future of Jordan. And so what he goes on to say is its smoke will go up forever. 
None will pass through it forever and ever, verse 11. But pelican and hedgehog will possess it. The owl and the raven will dwell in it. And he, God, will stretch over it the line of desolation and the plumb line of emptiness. Now, the symbol for our ministry is a plumb line. It's not a plumb line of emptiness, but it's a plumb line because the word of God is a plumb line. It's what you use to measure something to see if it is straight. It's a carpenter's tool. It's a building tool. And yet here he is stretching it out as a plumb line of emptiness. It's nobles. There is no one there whom they may proclaim king and all of its princes will be nothing. There is no one to make king. There is no one to be a prince. Thorns and thistles will come up in its fortified towers, nettles and thistles in its fortified cities. It will also be a haunt of jackals, an abode of ostriches. The desert creatures will meet with the wolves. The hairy goat will cry to its kind. Yes, the night monster will settle there and will find herself a nesting place. The tree snake will make its nest and lay eggs there and they will hatch and gather them for it's under its protection. Yes, the hawks will be gathered there, every one with its kind. In other words, with its mate and all the birds like that. Seek from the book of the Lord. Now listen and read. Not one of these will be missing. Not one of these things that he just said will be missing. None will lack its mate. None of these animals will be without a mate. In other words, they will cohabitate, so to speak. They will procreate. They will multiply. It says, for his mouth, God's mouth, has commanded and his spirit has gathered them. You see, God is over all of creation. He has cast the lot for them. His hand has divided it. What? Edom. You want to mark it red again. Line by to them by line. They, these animals, shall possess it. Put a clock there forever. From generation to generation, they these animals, the night monster, the, the, the uh, snake, uh, the tree snake, all of these things, the wolf, etc., they will possess it from generation to generation. They will dwell in it. It's not a pretty sight, is it? It's a total devastation, uninhabitable. Why? Why would God do that? We'll answer that in just a minute. Edom, a desolate habitation. That's what God says about the future of present day Jordan or that portion of present day Jordan. This is what's going to come to pass. Now, the question you and I have to ask is why? Why would God Almighty do this to Edom? When you ask the question and you explore the scriptures, you get your answer and then you learn a precept for life from that answer. So this is what we're going to do. I want us to look at some scriptures that have to deal with Edom. First of all, and I would make this list, and by the way, I just get a good pencil and I write it right in my Bible. We are looking at God's day of vengeance and the focus of that day of vengeance in chapter 34 of Isaiah is Edom. So I wrote down next to verse 8, the Lord's day of vengeance. Then I wrote down Edom and under Edom in pencil so that I can move it if I want to. I've written the following scriptures. Now there are other scriptures in these that than these that I could go to, but these are the main ones. So let's start in Genesis chapter 25, and we want to write down 22 through 
34. Now, I'm not going to read all of this to you because you can read it later. But in Genesis chapter 25, it says in verse 19, Now, these are the records of the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had two sons. Those two sons were twins. Look at what he says. It says, but the children struggled, verse 22, together within her. And she said, if it is so, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. What is, what's going on inside my belly? What's going on? And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples will be separated from your body. Now I want you to get the word nations and I want you to understand that each one of these twins represents a nation and one people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. You say, but they're twins. They're born on the same day. That's right. But one is born before the other. The older that is going to serve the younger is Esau. And it says, when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red, all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Now Esau is the father of the Edomites. Esau is the father of the Edomites. That Edomite gen uh, nation begins with the birth of Esau. And it says, when the boys grew up, verse 27, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. All right, now it says in verse 28, now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. But Rebekah, that's Isaac's wife, loved Jacob. Jacob cooks stew. Esau comes in from the field and he is famished. And Esau says to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff for I am famished. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Here he is, he comes out red, he comes hairy, then he sees the red stuff, he sees the stew that is red, and he says, let me have that, therefore his name was called Edom. Have you got it? Now watch what it says. But Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am about to die, so of what use then is the birthright to me? And Jacob said, first, swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and he drank, and he rose up and went on his way. He's just walking off. He just sold his birthright. What is his birthright? He's the firstborn. He has the right to be the primary inheritor of everything that Esau, everything that his father Isaac has. And now, because he's hungry, because of the appetite of his flesh, because he wants immediate gratification, he sells his birthright because he thinks he's going to die because he's so hungry. And Jacob gets it away from him. And it says, thus Esau despised his birthright. Esau despised it. It meant nothing to him. The eternal, so to speak, the long range benefits meant nothing to him because he wanted immediate satisfaction, immediate gratification. Well, this is meeting Esau, okay? You say, okay, he sold his birthright. Listen, that was a very important thing because God was raising up a nation and that nation was going to be the nation of Israel or the nation of Jacob. And so Isaac's child then would give birth to Jacob. 
God was uh, said to Abraham, and it's Genesis chapter 12, when he called him out of the Ur of, Cal of, the, Ur of the Chaldees, he, which is over in Babylon, he says, I will make of you a great nation, and in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So what Edom did was, or Esau did, excuse me, one and the same eventually, but what Esau did is he said, you know, that's not important to me. My flesh and my satisfaction of my flesh is important to me. All right, now I want you to put down Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, and I want you to go there because here is a New Testament commentary on this act. All the T's are together, and then you have the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews chapter 12, it is the chapter on discipline. It is the chapter on how God disciplines his sons. And it comes down, and this is what he says in verse 15, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. In other words, that no one fails to lay hold of the grace of God, the unmerited, unearned favor of God. He says that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. He says that there be no immoral, now watch how he describes Esau, no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. He says, that is displeasing to me. He says, see that there is none of you when I am chastening you and you are going through trials, don't fall short of the grace of God. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in your weakness. Appropriate the grace of God. Don't be like Esau, who was godless, who was immoral, who took his birthright that gave him the right to be the one in the bloodline of of uh, the birthright of Isaac. He says he despised his birthright for a single meal. And then it goes on to say, for you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. And when, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears, he was sorry, but he did not repent. It was just a sorrow at what he missed. So when we think of Edom, you've got to think of someone that had an opportunity to believe in the grace of God and he missed it. What about you? God has grace for you. Are you going to miss it just for the temporal? Or are you going to turn to God and say, God, I want to be in your bloodline. I want to be a child of the family of God. We'll deal with this more in depth in our next program, but think on it today, precious one. Well, as we've looked at Edom today, beloved, and as we have talked about God's judgment on Edom, we have to ask, what is God sharing with us? What is his precept for life? The truth that I need to take away, the truth by which I need to live, that which will give me understanding because he says, through thy precepts, I gain understanding and I hate every false way. What happened? Esau took a false way. Esau looked at the temporal and he despised the eternal. Esau's focus was himself. It was not God. It was not this birthright. You have to remember that what happened was God made a promise to Abraham. He made a covenant with Abraham. Then he makes a covenant with Isaac. We haven't seen that. I didn't take the time to show you, but he makes a covenant with Isaac. Then he makes a covenant with the one through whom he is going to continue his promise. He's going to make the covenant with Jacob 
with Jacob. Why? Because Esau despised his birthright. And because Esau despised his birthright, then God is going to judge him. What is your birthright and what is my birthright? Our birthright is the fact that God crucified his son for every human being that has ever lived on this planet. 1 John chapter 2 tells us that Jesus Christ is the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sins. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. In other words, what he is saying to you is this, that Jesus, that no man, can point to God and say, I couldn't go to heaven because you played favorites and you didn't take care of me and you made no provision for my sin. No man can ever say that to God. All men, Romans 1 says, are without excuse because when Jesus Christ hung on that cross, he who knew no sin was made to be sin for you and me. And our birthright is to be able to believe that and receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. And if we despise that, then we are judged by God. That's the picture of Edom. Think on it, beloved. Think long, think hard, and we'll talk about it tomorrow. Thank you for watching today. To order your copy of today's program, log on to our website at preceptsforlife.com. To download your free copy of the study guide or to find out more about Precept Ministries International, click on our website or call us today at 1-800-763-1990. Join us for our next program as Kay shares more Precepts for Life. What is your birthright and what is my birthright? Our birthright is the fact that God crucified His Son for every human being that has ever lived on this planet. 1 John chapter 2 tells us that Jesus Christ is the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sins. Join us for our next program as we discover more Precepts for Life.